Hello magic folks and welcome to cycle two in which we will start digging into Ogden using our new vocabulary and intellectual models to talk about the world of how Greek speaking folks thought about magic which is the unifying factor in the chapters I'm having you read. Uh, the first two are about uh, mostly male magicians and then uh, chapters five and six are about um, archetypal female magicians in mythology and literature before we go there though a quick tour of the ancient mediterranean um, and uh, a brief comment about why i'm telling you what i'm telling you in these lectures for this section I'm going to assume that not everybody is familiar with the ancient Mediterranean, so think about this as a bit of a targeted tour guide. So I'm going to bring up stuff that's going to help you figure out what's going on in the reading, and there's going to be a lot of generalization. Those of you who are familiar with the ancient Mediterranean will notice this, but this is stuff that's going to be useful. Starting with geography. Here we're looking at an early map of the known world. So this is the map of Hecateus of Miletus, who lived around 500 BCE. This is a really early map. But you'll notice after you get over the shock of things not being where you're used to them being, that already people in the Mediterranean were aware of quite a lot of what we now call the Eastern Hemisphere. One thing that's important to keep in mind, although this looks like a flat map, Hecateus of Miletus was aware, as were people by 500 BCE, that the Earth is curved. And within 100 years after that, there was broad agreement that the world was round. So this thing about Christopher Columbus discovering the rotundity of the globe is nonsense. It's been known for a really long time, and it's bad history textbooks from the 18 and 1900s who popularized this myth about ancient scientists thinking the world was flat, and the flat earth society should be ashamed of themselves. It's round, guys. It's round, and ancient Greeks knew this. So this they thought of as the map of the known world, but they also theorized that there was a part of the world on the other side, a part that they called the Antipodes, uh, because it was the place where people's feet are anti your feet, they're opposite. So the part of the earth where people are standing on the other side is the anti part of the earth. You'll notice there are three continents in this model, and this despite knowing, even by 500 BCE, that there's a geographical connection between Europe and Asia. So why talk about Europe and Asia as different continents? Well, if you live in the Mediterranean, you cannot go across land from Europe to Asia very easily. This looks like it's crossable but unless you know where the rivers are and you have horses and you don't mind braving aggressive nomadic peoples in the area this isn't really a crossable zone in fact it's still a difficult to cross zone as recently as world war ii and if you're wondering how that works ask hitler how invading russia went and then you have your answer there so Effectively, then, Europe and Asia were thought of as two different continents because it was just so hard to get from one to the other without crossing water. Water was the easiest way to get from one to the other, especially if you happen to live in the Greek-speaking world. And you'll notice the area I'm circling is not just mainland Greece. So Athens here is at the, is at the heart of what we now consider Greece, but Greek-speaking peoples by 500 BCE, we're living all over the Mediterranean, including all along this coast into Thrace, all along the Mediterranean facing coast of what is now Turkey, the Levant, this area here that includes uh, modern day Syria, Lebanon, Jordan, Israel, into 
the northern coast of Egypt, lots of Greek colony states in Egypt, and a few along the coast near Carthage. There were so many Greek-speaking colonists in southern Italy that Romans called that part of the peninsula Magna Graecia, or Greater Greece, which is a bit ironic that Big Greece isn't in Greece. And then, too, you had a lot of Greek colonists here in what's now Marseille, and then also a lot of them living along the Spanish coast here in Mauritania, modern-day Morocco. And then into the Black Sea, too, you had a lot of trading outposts along these two axes. So Greek speakers were living already in a global world as early as 500 BCE, which is much earlier than a lot of the passages in Ogden. Ogden is focusing on a time starting in the 5th century, so the 400s BCE, all the way into the years when Rome is controlling the Mediterranean, about 200 CE or AD. Long sweep of time there. But from the earliest days of Greek literature, Greek-speaking people are aware that they live in a global community with a lot of other people in it, and they're not always the dominant people. But this changes in the mid-300s when Macedon rises to prominence, Alexander goes on a rampage through the now former Persian Empire, and Greek speakers actively take over large portions of the Mediterranean as colonizing powers, as the Ptolemaic dynasty, the Seleucid and Antiochid dynasties, and then various people fighting over Macedon that we need not get into now. A couple of regions that are going to come up in your reading. Sometimes you'll see Africa called Libya. We're not talking about the modern country of Libya. Libya rather means Africa interior but north of the Sahara. The Sahara was much less large, less large, much smaller in antiquity than it is today. And also along the coast of North Africa, there was a lot more arable land. So it was actually a paradise heartland where a lot of different people lived next to each other in, well, pieces, an overstatement. You've already met some of these people. Cyrene, the place where the wax figures were being melted in example six, is right here on this promontory coming into the Nile River Delta. Now, Egypt, of course, was an area that had a long seated culture with a long history of urbanization, a history that was much longer and much more wealthy than were any of the places inhabited by Greek speakers. And Greek speakers knew this. So they thought of Egypt as this place where people knew more stuff. They had more years of research and knowledge. And that comes into the way that Greek speakers focus on Egypt as a place where specialized knowledge comes from, but also because it is an othered place, right? The people living in Egypt aren't speaking Greek. Uh, the word for that in Greek is barbarian. Barbarian to Greek speakers meant people whose language is not Greek. And they used it as a blanket term for everybody who's not us. It's the Greek word for the other, which is who Egyptians are. The other big other for Greek speaking peoples are folks who live, let me switch to another color, oh let's go for purple here, hereabouts in the chunk of Hecateus's map labeled Asia. This is the heartland of the Medo-Persian Empire, which at one, well really three points, invaded the Greek mainland the Greek mainland never forgot about this. Uh, it, in fact, nobody ever did. Uh, the movie 300 is a attempt, really shitty attempt, to make this into a blockbuster film. But the Persian Empire was the home of Zoroastrianism, a very old religion, still a religion, by the way. You probably know some Zoroastrianisms, Zoroastrians. Um, these are folks who now live in um, well, not all of them, um, because the ones I know are all American, but it's a religion that originates in what's now Iran, so ancient Persia, which in this map 
looks like this vague amorphous blob over here. You'll also notice that India, <laughs> India is like bare, uh, on the far eastern border of the Persian Empire was India to the south, and then if you continue across the Tarim Basin and the Gobi Desert, you'd finally get to China. By the time we get to the Roman Empire, Romans knew about China. There was some formal diplomatic contact in the second century CE, but it's really pretty far removed. For Greek speakers in the Mediterranean, the Persian Empire is far enough away to be a little difficult to understand and access, a little mysterious. Um, we'll use the post-colonialist term exotic. But it's close enough that Greek speakers would have regular contact with it. So it's in that sweet spot of far enough away to be different, but close enough to be accessible. And there's also this history of violence, mutual distrust, and attempts on either side to occupy each other's territory. Um, attempts, successes in the case of the Seleucids and also the Ptolemies. Um, the Persian Empire occupied Egypt in the generation before the Ptolemies occupied Egypt. Yeah, I think that's what you need to know to get some of the salt cultural subcontext especially when we get into the Magi. The Magi are a um, priestly class coming out of Persia. They're tied in with Zoroastrianism, but also a little bit with the religions of the Fertile, fertile Crescent, so Assyria, Babylon. They were early researchers in astronomy, but also astrology. Astronomy and astrology hadn't split at this point. So they're sitting on this ancient border between science and mysticism and religion. This means that they're exactly everything that Greek speakers are going to be thinking about when they're thinking about mysterious magical religious knowledge that doesn't come from Greek speaking sources. Now, another geographical note that's going to be useful and a segue into our next slide is Pythagoras. So Pythagoras is from the island of Samos, which is in the sea between uh, Samos, I think, is here-ish in the Ionian Sea. Shouldn't have used purple for that. So go back to red. So Samos is about here-ish. But he moved to the Greek-speaking colony state of Croton, which is down here near, if I remember correctly, the uh, Ankle instep area of Italy. And that's where he founded his school of philosophy. Now, you've probably met Pythagoras. In fact, if you've taken middle and high school algebra, you've met Pythagoras. He's the Pythagorean theorem guy. So, if you want to know who is responsible for causing you to experience high school geometry, um, that's this guy. But he's so much more than equations. Let's discuss. Now, I'm not going to go into his mathematical theories too much because I got Donald Duck to do that for me. Donald Duck is much more competent than I to talk about math. Um, I was not that great at high school algebra. Although really this, yeah, this is algebra technically, I think. Oh god, you see, you see, this is why the cartoon duck is doing it. Uh, you may be surprised to encounter a squared plus b squared equals c squared dude in a course about magic, but that has everything to do with why Pythagoras was doing magic, or mathematics rather. He wasn't doing math just because he liked solving equations or was trying to figure out the curvature of the globe. Interestingly, the Pythagoreans are early adopters, not only of the idea that the world is a globe, but of the idea that the sun is the center of the universe, not the earth. That's right, heliocentric cosmology comes out of Pythagoreanism. So like, not only did ancient people not think the world was flat, but some of them thought that the sun was in the center of the universe, or at least the solar system right? I don't know. It excites me. Now, Pythagoras was trying to do all this because he thought that 
Within mathematical relationships, one can begin to comprehend the mind of the divine, that within math, you could find the, um, as it were, fingerprints of the creator of the cosmos. So math wasn't just functional for him, it was sacred. So he's really sitting hard on this intersection between science, magic, and religion. And because of this spiritualism in his mathematical research and those around him, he, his followers followed Pythagoreanism as if it were a religion. Music was a form of worship to them, both because they felt it was a way of connecting to the cosmos, but also because music is based on mathematical principles of ratios of string length and harmonics between notes. They felt that you could minister to the human soul by creating harmonics that helped to bring out the good and suppress the bad. All of this gives us the roots of modern music theory. So if you've ever taken a music theory class, it starts with the Pythagoreans, but also architectural principles. I mean, Frank Lloyd Wright is in many ways kind of a modern Pythagoras. And I sort of like that, this spiritualism in design and this uh, worshipfulness taken into the realm of doing science is a uh, especially in a modern world where we draw a hard line, many of us, between um, worship and science, the fact that one can have sacred awe in the presence of the cosmos and not see that as a contradiction or attention is a neat concept to me. So let's see, anything else I need to tell? Oh, yes, you may be wondering, what the heck with the golden thigh? Well, I too am a little bit confused about the golden thigh thing. Um, and that does mean what it sounds like as far as we can tell the word is for gold, like the metal, and a thigh is a thigh. So what the heck? Like, why are there all these stories about Pythagoras having this random body part made out of gold that he's like flashing at people? How would that even work? That seems like an awkward thing to do. What is he like in bars showing people his thigh? Um, and like, why is this a symbol of his divinity? I am not entirely sure, but I can give you some context. Statues of the gods were frequently made uh, out of ivory coated with gold. The ivory would be steam bent over a wooden base into the shape of the face and the hands. And this would then be painted to look a little bit more lifelike. But this kind of paleness was considered otherworldly. Um, and in combination with gold, like gold isn't something you can usually wear, but if you're a god, it's expensive, it's shiny, it's pretty, it's not very useful. It's got a low melting point, so it's easy to turn into god clothing. Um, so if you're used to viewing your gods in the form of this ivory statue wearing golden clothing, then maybe when you see a person out in nature who has a golden body part, that's a way of saying that they're semi-divine, possibly. There's some mythological precedents. Um, there's a hero named Pelops who apparently had an ivory shoulder long story. Demeter took a bite out of it. It's this whole thing. You can Google it. But when it comes down to it, I'm not entirely sure what's going on with the golden thigh thing, and Ogden is irritatingly unhelpful when it comes to it. Nonetheless, that's one of the urban legends about Pythagoras. There's also a lot of interest in making fun of and debunking Pythagoras and Pythagoreans in the ancient world. Uh, they're a regular punchline in other philosophers' writings, although a lot of Romans seem very fond of Pythagoras because he was Italian. I mean, he's Greek-speaking, but he was from Italy in Croton, so they felt that he was less sketchy than other Greek philosophers, which is um, a lot to unpack there. Nonetheless, that's Pythagoras. Meet Pythagoras. There he is. 
see what you think about Pythagoras's other life that you didn't hear about in high school math. Next up, we need to talk about mystery religions and Orphic tablets because Pythagoreanism was connected with a religious movement and um, Movement maybe isn't the right word. So there's a category of religious devotion in the ancient Mediterranean that is called a mystery religion or sometimes a mystery cult. Cult here doesn't mean what it is for modern cults. We use it now as a shorthand for talking about closed religious systems that are often high demand uh, to the point of abusive and manipulative. This isn't necessarily so when we're talking about ancient mystery cults. Rather, a mystery cult is a special form of worship practiced around um, a regional variation of devotion to um, a god. So what I mean by that is that Zeus in Athens wasn't necessarily the same Zeus that you'd meet in Thebes or in Croton or in Morocco. The way that the Greek gods were worshipped in different cities had a lot of variations from the kinds of animals you would sacrifice to them, to the kinds of things you would do at festivals, to the ways that you would phrase your prayers, to the stories that you told about them. Ancient mythology, the stories told about the gods, weren't standardized. There wasn't an ancient polytheistic Bible where everybody agreed on the one true version of myth facts. In fact, you were encouraged to change the details with each retelling depending on what you were trying to say. The essence of the myth was not in whose parent was whose, but in the greater meaning behind the story. And so one way that you would pursue religious devotion was by traveling to a place that had a specific way of worshiping a god and learning how to do it in the local fashion. Now, out of that part of what I'm going to call, for lack of a better word, mainstream Greek polytheism, came a more exclusive sort of right. And this is what a mystery religion is. In order to worship a god in a mystery religion, you had to be initiated. It's a little bit like, in fact, not a little bit, it's pretty much exactly like the Freemasons, where you can't know everything about it until you go through different levels of initiation. And with each level of initiation, you find out more and more. The part of getting into these mystery religions was that you had to swear yourself to secrecy. If you broke that oath, you could be punished not just by people who were also in the mystery religion, but also by the laws of your state. For instance, Alcibiades, this Athenian politician, once got in super duper trouble because he was alleged to have revealed some of the mysteries of Eleusis, which is a mystery to Demeter and Persephone and Hades at Eleusis near Athens. This was one of the biggest and most popular mystery religions. And here's where this is going to get super frustrating. Because the details were secret, and weirdly, people kept the secret pretty darn well, um, or at least they didn't write it down in places where we can find it, like, um, if only ancient Wikipedia survived, maybe we'd have more details, but, you know, there's no internet. It's kind of hard to publish the real true facts about the cult of Demeter and Persephone at Eleusis, say, or the one we're going to look at now, the Orphic Mysteries. So these are myth mysteries sacred to Orpheus. More about him in a minute. We are not quite sure what you do with these mysteries. We don't quite know what it is that folks believed. We're not sure what these beliefs did for people. We've only got a few documents that give us evidence, and you're looking at one of them. So this piece of gold leaf, and this is gold, it's a rolled out sheet of gold with Greek letter writing in it. And it's a text 
that's part of a set of other golden tablets that's one of our best sources for what Orphic rites were about. I'll give you the gist and then we'll look at the actual text of this tablet. So part of the hint is in the name. Orpheus, you may know from the myth of Orpheus and Eurydice. If you don't, the short story is Orpheus was the best musician in the mythological world. And he got married to a woman named Eurydice, who was bitten by a snake and died on their wedding day. And he was just like destroyed by this because they were super duper in love. So in older versions of the myth, he goes to the underworld, he plays his music for Hades and Persephone, and they're super into it, so they let him have his wife back. But in later versions, uh, this is the version according to Ovid, Orpheus still has his concert. He goes all the way to the underworld, he makes it there, he plays his music, Persephone cries, Hades is like, wow man you really love your wife okay you can have her but there's a catch you can't look back to see if she's following you until you get back to the real world and then orpheus like an idiot as he's about to walk up the last few steps in from the underworld into the world above uh, quickly i don't want to assume you guys know what the underworld is for ancient Greek polytheists, the land of the dead was under the ground, and there was a whole world down there, ruled over by Hades, the king of the dead, and his wife Persephone. And within this world were all people, the good, the bad, the indifferent, just everybody ends up at Hades' house. And there's some subdivisions and zoning ordinances, but essentially like all the dead people go there. But not just dead people there are also a lot of gods who live there too so it's kind of like an alternative mount olympus it's just the underground you know moria mount olympus so that's going to be important later orpheus then in this version fails to get his wife eurydice back and then he's he just is utterly destroyed by this. He wanders the earth singing super depressing songs. The rocks cry, the trees cry, the entire world is just totally emo because Orpheus is the world's best bard and he's really sad. Finally, a bunch of worshippers of Dionysus, these female followers of Dionysus called the Minads or the Menads, um, they work themselves up into these out-of-body ecstasy states where they rampage through the countryside and tear things apart. So they run into Orpheus and they're so noisy they can't hear his emo songs and they kind of rip him into pieces and then his head floats down the river still singing sad emo songs and then he gets to be with his wife for all eternity in the underworld. So I guess that's a happy ending? This spawned its own mystery religion, where people devoted to the songs of Orpheus would learn things that we think were meant to give you a better chance at getting to a good neighborhood when you went to the House of Hades. And let me show you why we think that. Uh, by the way, the gold on the tablets is gold because of the same reasons that Pythagoras is Pythagoras. Pythagoras's thigh is gold. Gold is associated with divinity and with the supernatural, so it's this divine good metal. So if you want to have lawful good religious texts for your secret initiation ritual, gold is a great choice. Okay. Here's the text itself. For those of you listening, I'll read it for you. This is the work of Mnemosthene. She's the goddess of memory. When you are about to die, you will find the houses of Hades. There is a spring on the right side. Beside it, a white, white cypress tree stands. There, the souls of the dead come and rest. Do not go near these streams. Further, you will find the cold water from the harbor of memory. So what we think these are are step-by-step -step directions on how to get to the underworld without I don't know what the souls do to you if you go over and talk to them. Maybe they tear you apart, steal your money, mug you. Um, 
give you a bad mortgage deal. Uh, but at any rate, this suggests to us that initiation into the Orphic Mysteries gave you special insider information that helped you do better in the afterlife. Now, you may be wondering at this point, what does that have to do with Pythagoras' math cult? Join the club? We are not sure. But what we do know is a lot of the people who were being initiated into Orphic rites were also Pythagoreans and vice versa. The two seemed to have some kind of an alliance going on. So perhaps some of what was happening in the Orphic cult rested on Pythagorean philosophical principles. The music thing is the most likely point of connection, because keep in mind, Pythagoras is all about how mathematics explain why good music sounds good. Orpheus is all about the best music that can sway even the most rock-hard souls. And the Orphic texts are all about knowledge and persuasion in order to win a better afterlife. So if you think about it from that perspective, yeah, okay, it, it kind of does make sense that mystic mathematics can have a lot to do with mystic musical mystery tour cults. Magical mystery tour is coming to take you away to Hades. Oh boy.